we're going to start looking at the guidelines for exercise prescription. Okay, and um, we're going to look at aerobic prescription guidelines today. Um, Monday, we'll look at the resistance and flexibility and neuromotor. Um, should be able to get through those three. There's more to the aerobic one. So um, I think that will work out for us. Um, just to show you there's uh, some information in the class notes that you want to be looking at. Uh, that's my, we go. So the ACSM FIT guidelines um, are what we're going to be going through um, with a little bit of adaptation. The ACSM ones are a bit more rigorous. Um, and then there's a web link here um, that would help you out as well. So these three items here are related to what we're going to be covering in this chapter. Okay. Oops. Anybody have any questions on the cardiovascular disease information from Wednesday? The book does a nice job of looking at those diseases. Um, it does also look at blood pressure, um, high blood pressure and uh, um, diabetes, but I'm going to wait and look at those uh, in the special populations chapter. So we'll we'll come back to the diabetes situation. Pardon me. Okay, so here we go. As you probably worked out on Wednesday, um, being sedentary um, seriously increases your risk of some form of coronary artery disease, cardiovascular disease. Um, and what we understand from the literature is that it isn't that I have to exercise. So we'll go back to those of you that have had motor behavior with me. I've said this a lot in motor behavior, but also we talked about this a little bit earlier in the semester uh, when we were looking at your physical activity log. Remember that to be physically active does not necessarily mean that I have to have an exercise program, right? So. We've got to be careful of um, using the right terminology with the people that we're working with, right? Because if the person you're working with is not an athlete or not a recreational athlete, um, then using that term exercise for some people is a bit of a trigger. Okay, because exercise in their head brings up pictures of running miles or um, being in a weight room and having to lift weights and things like that, right? And, and they don't like that environment, so we don't want to always use that word, all right? And your physical activity logs are hopefully driving you to look at activity outside of exercise that you can incorporate into your log, right? So we know that um, 
that low intensity activity um, does reduce the risk of coronary artery disease. So things like walking, um, you know, not power walking, but just going for a walk or doing some gardening, right? Um, you can turn walking and gardening into something of higher intensity, but if we take a typical picture, okay? So the key is physical activity, not necessarily fitness, right? I don't have to be really fit to be healthy when we look at coronary artery disease. Okay? And this is an important distinction, as I said, because Jonathan, you're working in the gym right now for your internship, right, with Darlene? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Is everybody that comes into the gym uh, an elite athlete or a recreational athlete or someone that's looking to get super, super fit? Uh, yeah, everybody's trying to get fit, but not everybody, like you said, is like an athlete. Yeah, right? So, I would say, be careful. Is everybody trying to be fit or is everybody trying to be healthy, right? So, this is the distinction that I want you to be thinking about, particularly when you're in an environment like that. And I know snap is, is a little hardcore, but... Um, you know, try to, try to think about health versus fitness, okay? So, we don't have to do high intensity exercise. If we can do moderate intensity exercise, then we're going to have some quite major benefits. So, we don't have to exercise vigorously or, or very hard, but the harder we work or the more vigorous we work, then it's likely we're going to get more health benefits from that. But it isn't necessary to do that, all right? Because just working at low to moderate levels will improve the elasticity, remember the compliance of the of the arteries, of the coronary arteries, we'll see some reduction in blood pressures. Um, improved insulin sensitivity is a biggie because that directly impacts type 2 diabetes, right? So doing moving at all helps insulin sensitivity at the muscle membrane. And that improves glucose transport out of the bloodstream into the muscle tissue. And that's a huge benefit for people with type 2 diabetes. All right? And then, depending on using our rules that we learned earlier in the semester, right, it can help with weight reduction, particularly fat mass. Right? But we have to apply the rules that we learn about crossover and intensity levels if we want to hit that last point there, okay? So, the guidelines have been constructed because um, everybody recognizes the health problems that are occurring in the United States. So we know that there's an overweight obesity explosion. We know there's a type 2 diabetes explosion. We know we're seeing more coronary artery disease earlier in the lifespan rather than later in the lifespan. So everybody's aware of these problems. Drives me a bit batty that we're so aware of these problems and yet we're making so little inroad into them. Um, but hopefully that's where you lot will come into play. You know, you're gonna learn about this and go out there and be the, be the spokesperson for health and wellness and 
physical activity and or exercise, right? Um, so what they are hoping is that by providing these guidelines, it will help people that don't have a background in being physically active, particularly when we look at endurance exercise, that, that it will give them the tools to try to um, start that, that regime, right? Um, so particularly if we're improving aerobic fitness, aer aerobic capacity, then we see health benefits, not just cardiovascular disease, but also uh, bone density issues can be improved up to a point. Um, certain types of cancers seem to respond well to um, being physically active. So the ACSM and the American Heart Association guidelines um, are the uh, basis for the information in the textbook, but you've also got the link on your physical activity log guidelines to the Department of Health and Human Services. And their guidelines are similar. I would say that AHA and the DHHS are a little more geared to a typical person. Um, the ACSM guidelines are a little more rigorous and are geared perhaps to someone who's a, um, uh, hmm, an activity buff or a recreational athlete, okay? Um, Their the definitions, it's not that the actual guideline is that different, but their definitions of moderate and vigorous intensity are quite different. So, for example, um, walking briskly counts, walking counts as moderate intensity for the AHA and the DHHS, but walking doesn't count as moderate for the ACSM. Right? So, things like that, you have to just, you know, again, pick the tool that's most appropriate for the individual you're working with, okay? Um, so, we want moderate intensity, aerobic exercise, um, five days a week. So they set a goal of 150 minutes a week for 30 minutes. And you can do that 30 minutes in one go. Or they say that you can spread it over three 10-minute sessions. Again, it depends who you're working with, right? And what they want to achieve, okay? So remember that our fat mass situation, the crossover where we start to utilize more stored fat for an energy source is a minimum of 20 minutes. So if I do three lots of 10 minutes for my aerobic, my cardio work, that's going to improve coronary artery disease and cardiovascular disease and artery health, but it will not help to lose fat mass. Right? So you can do moderate levels of intensity work for five days a week, or you can do vigorous, high intensity work three days a week for a minimum of 20 minutes, right? Again, it depends on who you're working with. And of course, you can always combine the two, right? You can do a little bit of both. Um, they say it's not appropriate for recreational and competitive endurance athletes who would need something more advanced. I'm not sure I totally agree with that. I think, I think that um, for most recreational athletes, the, the guidelines are going to provide what they need. Unless they want to be out running for two hours a day or biking for two hours a day, you know, something like that. 
But, um, you know, for most of us, if we go for a bike ride that's two hours, that's a once a week or once a month event. You know, we go, it's a, it's a planned day out, right? We don't go out and ride our bike for two hours every day. Um, they're pro they are probably appropriate for competitive athletes who are anaerobic, so strength power type athletes who also need an element of aerobic fitness. You could use these guidelines, okay? And it's important to understand that the, the magnitude of the problem that we're facing, right? We've got nearly half of the adult population in the country reporting that they basically do no leisure time activity that is 10 minutes or longer, right? So, I mean, that's scary, <laughs> okay? Um, we have around a quarter, a little less than a quarter of adults who do anything that's vigorous, right? So, again, a very small number of, of people in the country, all right? So, um, why that is, is a complicated question. Right? As I said, we have all this information, we know that that is not the way to move forwards. And yet, it's the lifestyle choice for many, many, many people, right? So, we've, we've got a, it, the picture is bigger than just knowing that being sedentary isn't healthy, right? So, our aerobic exercise prescription then. So, we... We want to look at our fit matrix. We're going to create a fit matrix, right? Um, and so the book has the um, order of the elements in a slightly different order to our fit. So our fit would say frequency, intensity, time, duration, and type, okay? And typically, we are looking at the minimum threshold for health, aerobic health, and some fitness gains. It's going to vary by individual because everybody responds differently. Everybody has a different starting place. And your prescription may change over time Again, depending on what the goal is, right? Because for some people, the goal isn't to keep improving, keep improving, keep improving. For some people, it's I want to get to a point where I'm doing enough to be pretty healthy and I want to stick at that, right? I don't want to add any more commitment than that, right? So we have our overload principle, but for some people, they want to plateau and just maintain that plateau. Other people are going to need continual overload to see continued progress, right? So again, pick your, your material and the way you apply the material specific to the person that you're working with. So there's a nice table 14.4 with lots of ideas for aerobic activity. Um, they've got um, different types depending upon kind of the level that someone's willing to commit to. Um, I, I think it's a really nice table actually. It would be worth photocopying it or photoing it and blowing it up and having it with your information. Um, but any of the kind of exercise -y type 
movements, jogging, running, speed walking, or even brisk walking, uh, cycling, ellipticals, swimming, uh, aerobic dance or class, Zumba classes, right, rowing. Okay. So we've got lots of sporty type exercises that would count for aerobics. But it's got to be something that the person enjoys so that they stick with it, right? If they dread it every day, sooner or later they're going to quit and go away, right? And that's why I think it's very important that we consider physical activity, things outside of exercise that we can use to improve health, cardiovascular risk. Right? So doing the gardening, raking the lawn, doing the vacuuming, all right? but doing the vacuuming a little more vigorously than maybe just you know, pushing the vacuum. All right? Put some music on and dance around while you're vacuuming or something like that. Try to, try to think outside the box when it comes to what are we going to include as our type. Okay? Um, also, you can cross-train, which I think is a good idea for people who aren't kind of um, blinkered with their program. You know, do, do a choice, right? Do a bike ride one day and a brisk walk one day and a swim another day, right? If I'm not training for an event, then it doesn't matter if I mix and mash everything together. Okay? Duration, so the time on our fit, right, would be um, three 10 minute sessions or a 30 minute session, okay? That's, remember, that's the minimum for fitness gains or for health, okay? As long as the minimum threshold is met, then we've got some choices as to how we put that together. We can do slightly shorter durations and ramp up the intensity level. So if someone can manage it, instead of doing 30 minutes of low moderate, intensity, we could do 20 minutes of something that's a lot more vigorous, right? Or we can do longer durations and lower intensities, okay? Generally, for most people, um, somewhere between 30 to 60 minutes is going to be the recommendation. 60 minutes would be the maximum you would set an aerobic session for. Um, and for most people, you're going to want to use something in the moderate range, right? Um, high intensity exercise uh, has benefits for aerobic capacity, for pushing your VO2 max, for pushing your lactate threshold, but it's also associated with a much bigger risk of getting hurt. Um, and for normal people, um, burnout and, and drop out from the program because it's just too hard. It's not fun when it's that much hard work, right? So again, pick your population, right? Minimum duration, 20 to 30 minutes per session, depending upon the intensity. So if I'm going to use a moderate intensity, the minimum duration would be 30 minutes. But if I'm going to use vigorous intensity, the minimum duration would be 20 minutes. But again, that vigorous level is probably going to be for a much smaller percentage of your clientele than your moderate 30 minute session. would normally be the first thing on the table, right? So if you look at the ACSM document that I 
have up there on the blackboard, frequency comes first, right? Not because it's more important than the other two, just because that way they have an acronym that's easy for people to remember, FIT, right? So, how often am I going to train? Right, so we've done what kind of training I'm going to do. We've done how long I'm going to work out for. Now we want to do how often do I work out. Right, so the minimum threshold where we would see the most improvement in cardiovascular fitness would be three days a week. Okay, and the recommendations say you can go up to five days. So in our chart, we would have three to five days per week, okay? That's one of the places where a competitive athlete might want an extra day. They might want six days a week. Don't ever let anyone do seven days a week, right? That is a bad plan, that is a picture to crashing out, right? So maximum six days. There's always got to be at least one rest day a week. Two rest days is good. Okay. So up to five days a week will increase aerobic capacity a little bit uh, faster, right? Um, but again, it depends who you're working with. That might not be important. Okay. Over five days a week is not recommended. So again, other than a competitive athlete, um, everybody kind of fits in here because more than five days a week, we do not see any improvement in aerobic capacity. So VO2 max, lactate threshold, doesn't improve any more doing six days a week than it does doing five days a week. And that extra day of workout versus rest means that we're more likely to get hurt at some point, right? And um, five days a week is, you know, it's easy to put together five days where we're mixing up intensities across the five days, we're mixing up the type of workout we're doing across the five days so that it's more enjoyable it's, and, and the motivation stays high to stick with the program, right? Greater frequencies, so going to five days a week might assist with um, loss of body fat, if that's the goal, right? So we want to get them working at the correct intensity for our fat max zone. We need them working for over 20 minutes at a time. And, and then, ooh, that was weird. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and if we can get them up to five days, then they're going to see uh, greater progress towards their goal. Right? Okay, so our number one variable, right? This is the most important element in the prescription. If you do not get the intensity correct, doesn't matter which type of exercise we're doing, we'll talk about intensity for resistance work on Monday, but if you don't get the intensity right, you will not achieve the goal that was set for the program, okay? So it's really important to understand how we set intensity, okay? So, Typically, we would use some form of a heart rate measure. I'm so glad that they agree with me. Heart rate, it's so easy. Just use heart rate. <laughs> it doesn't lie, right? It, you know exactly how hard you're working at any particular moment in time if you're keeping track of your heart rate. It's ideal, okay? 
So a moderate level of intensity, if we're looking at VO2 max, would be 40 to 59 percent. Okay, so remember that we can, we covered the next few slides earlier in the semester in lab, okay, so remember that we can calculate uh, a VO2 max percentage by using the Carbonum method, that heart rate reserve method, um, which, so we can use heart rate to estimate VO2 max percentage, right? Or you can just go heart rate percentage, right? Heart rate max. So, um, even at very low intensities, 30 to 39% of VO2 max, um, we can see improvement. So people who are really unfit, who, are, who have been very sedentary for a long time, you might have to start off at a very low level of intensity and work them into the program. All right, bless you. So it's important to remember that heart percentage heart rate max isn't the same as percentage VO2 max. All right. So I gave you this chart in um, in lab, but here it is again, just to make sure that you pay attention to the unit that is in the program. Okay, because if I'm at 70% heart rate max, I'm only at 50% of VO2 max, right? So my VO2 number is always going to be lower, percentage-wise, right? But when you calculate the heart rate, there's a, there's a couple of really good practical boxes around about here in the chapter. Um, box 14.3 and box 14.4, right? So is there a difference between using a percentage of heart rate max or a percentage of VO2 max or peak oxygen consumption? And can we use percentage peak oxygen consumption to prescribe aerobic training? So two very applied, very useful um, pieces of information there, I would recommend that you read those, okay? Um, I like to use, as you know, percentage heart rate max because all the calculations for the heart rate reserve are a pain in the behind. <laughs> so just percentage heart rate max. Um, and then we're looking at anywhere from 55 to 65 as a kind of moderate and or even 69 and then 70 to like 90, 92 as a crazy vigorous workout. So let's review the material that we did in lab, okay? So there's a linear relationship between how hard I am working, so my intensity level, and oxygen consumption, right? And um, oxygen consumption will plateau after a certain amount of training. So anywhere between eight to 12 weeks, you're gonna see someone who was uh, new to the program, they're gonna improve, 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 and then they will plateau, all right? Um, same with heart rate, all right? There's a very linear relationship between how hard I'm working, and my percentage of my heart rate max, okay? So, 
it's ideal if we can get into Dr. Barlow's lab and do a stress test and get a pretty true picture of heart rate max. But most of us can't, right? We don't have the time to get over there. Um, I'm hoping that you watched the video yesterday from the uh, VO2 max test that Dr. Barlow had filmed for us. It's very interesting. If you haven't, make sure you get that watch this weekend. So if we can't get a true heart rate max through a treadmill test, then we're going to estimate our heart rate max. The, the very uh, basic calculation for that is 220 minus your age. Um, that's going to have the most amount of error in it, okay? There are a couple more accurate ones out on the uh, web. The one in the book is 207 minus 0.7 times your age, uh, which is more accurate than 220 minus your age. The problem is most of us can't do that math in our head, right? So then you've got to be a little organized and get it all worked out ahead of time. Okay? Um, there is a, if you look on the web, there's a 208 minus something, there's also a 209 minus something. Right? Um, and then we have this example. So this is, this is how you would set the training intensity, the training range. Okay? So if you're working with someone who's 20, and we use the more complicated equation, then their heart rate max is going to be somewhere around 193 beats per minute. Okay? Then we have to decide what's the training range, right? So what's the goal of the program? And if I know the goal, then I can set a training range. You never want to set one number because heart rate is too variable. You can't keep it at one number and you can't keep it within a very tiny range. So you've got to set a, a decent range, okay? So in this example, they set 77 to 90%, okay? So this individual is trying to get fitter and um, improve their cardiovascular fitness and their VO2 max or their lactate threshold, not lose fat, right? This is too high for fat loss, okay? So, 77%, the bottom end of the range is 193 times 0.77. So, I would round that up to 149. And the top end of the range is 193 times 0.9. I round it up to 178. So if they have a heart rate monitor or they've got an Apple Watch or a Fitbit, you'd set their training range for 149 to 174. And then they can just keep looking at it while they're working out and make sure that they're within that range or like my heart rate monitor bleeps at me and it gives me a different bleep if I drop too low than if I go too high. Okay? If you're going to set the intensity on a VO2 max, you would do the same thing but use a percentage of their VO2 max or their heart rate reserve, training heart rate, right? So, heart rate reserve is heart rate max minus heart rate at rest. So you can do a percentage of their heart rate reserve as a training range, or you can use heart rate reserve to calculate a specific percentage of VO2 max, and then your training heart rate would be your resting heart rate plus whatever the intensity is times the heart rate reserve. As I said, right, if I'm going to measure my heart rate, I might as well 
do a percentage, oops, that's going the wrong way, a percentage of that heart rate, <laughs> rather than the, the math that's involved here. But, you know, if you are using a program from a book or from a, a training journal of some kind, and the program is set in VO2, then you're going to have to use heart rate reserve to calculate VO2. Okay? Does that make sense? Any questions on that? aerobic intensity using perceived exertion, but it is not a physiological measure of intensity. So now we're talking about someone's understanding of how hard they're working and their perception of how hard they're working. You can't use RPE with a beginner, right? Because they don't have enough experience to judge how hard they're working. So that's an issue if you're working with someone that's coming into a new program, right? Um, if you use a Borg scale, there's a, um, diet, a figure that lays out the Borg scale and that figure 14.7 is on page 441 in the book. Um, the typical bulk scale runs from 6 to 20. You can find other ones online that go from 1 to 10. Um, but generally when you see a comparison chart of RPE to VO2 to percentage heart rate, it's, a, it's an old-fashioned bulk scale 6 to 20. All right. So then we're looking at uh, perceived exertion of 12 to 16 on that scale for aerobic adaptations. Right. I'm not a fan, personally, because I'm not sure I would trust myself to be honest with it. Um, but the research says that if you want to use RPE, a bulk scale, with an experienced uh, exerciser that they're pretty good that they're pretty good at judging how hard they're working on the number scale and if you were taking their heart rate at the same time they'd be pretty accurate all right so I'm not saying it's bad I'm just saying I wouldn't use it right um, and the book does say it shouldn't be your primary means of estimating intensity. Okay. So, you know, I take that, I'm, I'm, you know how I feel, I'm sticking with my heart rate. <laughs> Quick, easy, cheap, and accurate. METS, oh, that, would, that should say 14.5, sorry. METS, um, they do have quite uh, again, on page 441, table 14.5, um, they do have actually quite an interesting table here where they've got um, the MET estimate for different activities. So activities at home, activities at work, and activities playing sports. So that's quite a useful um, resource, I think, that table. But METS, again, is not... Uh, not a physiological measure unless you're in a lab, right? Because what you're going to do out in real life is say, oh, I'm working six times harder than I think I work when I'm sitting down. Therefore, I'm working at six minutes. Right? So again, it's kind of a subjective guesstimate of how hard you're working. 
Moderate intensity if you're using something that's set up in METS is 3 to 6, vigorous is over 6. But you're not measuring anything for real unless you're in a lab hooked up to a machine. Okay. So use it as a guideline rather than a reality. And then there's the talk test. Um, so really the only people you would use a talk test with are absolute beginners who basically not ever done any kind of organized physical activity program. Um, someone who's severely, severely overweight, obese. Um, and you're not going to be working with them every day, right? So maybe you're only going to see them once a week. Um, really, if you're going to use the talk test, you've got to assume that they're going to be working at a pretty low intensity in order to hold that conversation, okay? Um, both on a concentration kind of attention and a being able to get my breath to have a conversation. So they're going to be working at probably below moderate levels if you're using a talk test. Again, the, the suggestion is that it shouldn't be your primary measure of intensity, right? So maybe on the day you work with them, you use their heart rate but until they've got some experience, you don't want to teach them all the information about heart rate. And so you tell them to walk fast enough to still be able to talk to their husband, friend, daughter, whoever's going with them, dog, right? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Five minutes? A little bit less? Okay. So, for most people, there's going to be some progression necessary to a point. All right? Uh, and again, as I said earlier, depending on who you're working with, some people will only want to progress, okay, this is it, this is as fit as I want to be, this is as much time as I'm willing to commit, and this is it, now I'm going to maintain this, right? Remember our overload principle, if I want to see adaptation in the system, I have to stress the system, right? Once the system has adapted to that level of stress, if I want to see further progression, I have to add more stress, right? So if we want continued fitness improvement, we have to um, look at how do we progress the prescription or the program, all right? And we want to progress relatively slowly to make sure that we don't run into fatigue issues or injury issues and hopefully not overtraining issues. All right, we'll talk about overtraining next week. So, the best ways to progress an aerobic prescription. You've got some opportunity to change the type of exercise that they're doing from something that's relatively low impact walking, cycling, to something that's harder, jogging, running. So at the trail, we can start off walking around the trail, then we walk, jog around the trail, then we jog the trail, then we jog, run, and then we run, right? Or we can play around with the duration, which is a preferred progression if you're working with a beginner. Okay, so we're going to go from our 30 minutes a day to 60 minutes a day in little increments. Right? 
five to ten minutes about every one to two weeks. So depending on how well they're managing the workload, you can increase it by five minutes every week or five minutes every two weeks. Okay. And by six weeks into the program, then you know, hopefully you've got them up to 40, somewhere 45 to 60 minutes worth of work each time they go out. Okay? And then we can play around with intensity. So once we've increased the duration, then we can start increasing the intensity, change the training range on the heart rate watch. Again, depending on what the goal of the program is. Okay. Questions? Oops. So that's column number one on our prescription matrix. Alright, so as I said, on Monday we'll tackle resistance, flexibility, and probably neuro. Okay. And by the time we finish, you'll have a nice little chart. I'll put a chart together and put it up for you. <laughs> or you could be doing a little chart as we're going along for yourself, whichever works best. But you want a little matrix that's your template to then create a specific prescription for an individual from. Right? Here's, my, here's my guidelines in my matrix. Now I'm going to take each element and I'm going to make it specific for this person. comments all right I intend to get the exam graded this weekend and back out on the grade book so keep your eyes out for that um, keep working on your physical activity logs especially the theory discussion because that was pretty weak so dig into that don't 